Hello, my name's Will, and this is Will to. That's right. Today we're not going to be talking about books uh, because I've been busy with doing coursework and didn't really feel like putting in the energy to write a review. So instead, today, we're going to be looking at my 10 favorite horror movies, uh, plus a few extra ones, so actually it's more than 10. But anyway, <laughs> so I set myself a couple rules when coming up with this list, one of which being that there would be only one movie per director. There also would be no more than one movie per series, which that one actually didn't end up being a problem because none of these movies are from series. They're all standalone films. And then I also wanted to try to get a e relatively even distribution of classics and more modern films. So that's not just all stuff from like the 70s and 80s or all stuff that's come out within the past 10 years or something like that. So I think I have a pretty good distribution. I also was trying to make it diverse as far as like where the movies are from uh, and languages. So, which I think I succeeded at relatively well. It, it is obviously still a bit more English heavy than any other language, but only four of the films are actually American or British. So I, I think I succeeded pretty well there. <laughs> So anyway, let's, uh, let's get to it. The first film is a film that I've watched more than any other film, because in high school, if I was bored and didn't know what to do, I would just put in my DVD copy of it and just watch it. Like, I'd watch it on repeat. 1973's The Wicker Man, directed by Robin Hardy. This is a classic of the genre. It really, it's not the first folk horror film, but it's the one that established a lot of tropes and the one that you see a lot of folk horror films today ripping from. Like, for example, Midsommar. I love Midsommar, but its plot beats are very similar to the Wicker Man, the original Wicker Man. <laughs> so it, this is a great one to check out if you really like folk horror. This movie, also includes a lot of, it's not a Hammer horror film, but it does include a lot of regulars from Hammer, like Igrid Pitt, and of course, the legend, Christopher Lee, who actually worked on this movie for free because he believed in the movie so much. He, he realized that his normal, uh, his normal price would be too high for them. They wouldn't be able to make the film, essentially, so he decided he would just work for free, essentially. This movie is not particularly scary, but it is a really good mystery, and it does a very good job of establishing a very unsettling atmosphere. And so you're questioning things basically the entire time until the end. And of course, the movie's basically also a musical. It's got a lot of Celtic folk music in it, and if you like that, honestly, that might be reason enough to watch this film. <laughs> corn rigs and barley rigs and corn rigs are coming. I'm not the man of the corn the bees are falling. Up next, I'm going to talk about 1932's Freaks, directed by Todd Browning. So, in 1931, Todd Browning had directed a, a little indie film called the Dracula, starring Bella Lugosi. And after that, Universal, basically because of the success of that film, Universal basically let him do whatever he wanted for his next film. And what he decided to do was this, which is, um, so Todd Browning, before becoming a director, worked in the circus. And he, you know, he had experiences with people performing in the freak shows. And basically he, this film is about them. And what I, one of the things I love about this film is that it really humanizes these people and they are not the monsters of the film. Like there's so many horror films where people with physical deformities 
are just seen as the monster by default, whereas here, they are not. It's actually the people who are uh, uh, normal who, who are the monstrous ones. And actually, this film is really interesting because it's really not a horror film for the majority of it. It really is more of like a family drama for like until the climax, essentially. And then, and then, oh God, that climax. If you've had any questions about whether or not Todd Browning's a good director or whether or not there, there could be scary scenes in early horror films, films from like the 30s, watch the climax of Freaks. One th another thing that's really notable about this film is that all of the Freaks were actual uh, sideshow performers. So like the main couple of the film are two members of the doll family and some other prominent performers that are included uh, make appearances are um, uh, Johnny Eck, Daisy and Violet Hilton, and Schlitzy. There are some other Todd Browning films. So I was between doing this or Mark of the Vampire, which is another one of his that I really love, but I decided on Freaks because it is more of a true horror film, whereas Mark of the Vampire is more of a, a horror comedy. And also, you, you have to be familiar with well, I guess you don't have to, but it really helps to be familiar with the tropes of the Universal Horror movies that they're making fun of. And actually, it's it's very fun because it's also Bela Lugosi's in it as a vampire. And it's, and it, yeah, it's great just seeing the two of them working together again after Dracula. And yeah, it's, it's just a fun film. I'd also highly recommend that one. Oh, fuck. Damn it. I need to... Uh, no. Ah, no. I'm reading Gender Trouble for a for a for a paper. That's the book that fell. Up next is we're going to be talking about The Thing by John Carpenter from 1982. What 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 can I really say? This is such a <laughs> this is a film. I feel like you have to put on this li a list like this because it's it's just so good. It's so iconic. I mean, John Carpenter's a great director. I think that this is his best film. I mean, I haven't... I actually haven't seen a lot of his films, but of the ones that I've seen, this is definitely the standout. The atmosphere, just the t really... Just the building of that atmosphere is just so masterfully done. And of course, you also have just some of the best practical effects of any movie ever. It's just so good and of course you know as, as a supplemental recommendation i guess i guess i could I, i'll just say like halloween halloween's great i mean just watch a john carpenter film he's just great and he he's not he's not perfect <laughs> the fog but uh you know he, he's very consistent and you know even his at least of the ones that i've seen that i wasn't particularly impressed with they're at least entertaining and you know there's at least a uniqueness there and something worth enjoying number four is 1974's black christmas directed by bob clark who would later go on to direct another horror classic a christmas story so I love Black Christmas because it's it's a slasher film. I'm not a huge fan of a lot of slasher films. They can be very fun, but I find a lot of them don't really have a lot to say, and they're just it's just and the end of, they're, they're just the. <laughs> but this is a slasher film pre the tropes being established, so there is a very tense atmosphere, and you really do not know what is going to happen. You don't know who's going to die because that trope hasn't been established yet. Like, this isn't really a spoiler because this happens really early on in the film, but the Virgin is the first one who dies. That's not something that happens in slasher movies. What are you doing, Bob Clark? Stop it. Number five. We're leaving the safety of English language horror and moving to uh, the boot. Italy, for 1977's Suspiria, directed by Dario Argento. This film's plotline isn't great. <laughs> I will say that right off the bat. I don't think the plot is particularly well done. I think it falls back on some 
giallo tropes to its detriment. Like, why is a witch killing people with a razor blade when they have magic powers? But, but, this film is a feast for the senses. The lighting is insanely beautiful. Just so good. The directing is great. There's some just amazing shots. And I mean, come on, the score, the score is done by Goblin. It's one of the few movie scores that I will just list in on its own. And Taro Argento is just a great director. Um, I would also highly recommend some of his more straight giallo films, uh, particularly his Animal Trilogy. Uh, I'm a big fan of Bird with Crystal, with the Crystal Plumage uh, in particular, but yeah, but I mean, that whole trilogy is very good. So check that out. And from Italy, we go to the other side of the world, essentially, to Japan, and probably one of the more obscure films on this list, uh, 964 Pinocchio, directed by Shozen Fukui, I probably mispronounced that, uh, from 1991. This film, like Suspiria, is kind of a convoluted plot. It's not the best plot. It's a very entertaining plot, but it's not really important why it's not really why this movie is good it's it's essentially i mean it's it's about a sex robot who has a malfunction that uh it can't it can't get an erection so it gets thrown in the trash and then it kind of is the story of it becoming trying to integrate into society and also this the company trying to find it again because i guess it's like a secret technology or something this is part of the Japanese cyberpunk movement. For example, like, Fukui worked on, I believe as an assistant director, on uh, Tetsuo the Iron Man, which is very similar uh, style, but I think 964 Pinocchio is just better. I think it's, I, I love the use of energy. It, the energetic camera movements are just insane. It just, like, it gives you an adrenaline rush. The visuals are just, some of the visuals and costume designs are just wild, and I love it. Unfortunately, Fukui only directed two feature-length films, uh, the other being Rubber's Lover, which is a very solid film as well, and I would recommend that uh, as well. As well. As well. Have I said as well yet? For number seven, we're going to stay in Japan, but move over to the field of animation and discuss Perfect Blue, directed by Satoshi Kon. This again is like a film that's been talked to death. The, the plot is just very suspenseful it's very psychological it really gets in your head and gets into the idea of like what is a person what is a person's identity what is what is anything what's reality and then i mean on top of that the animation's just beautiful really just gets you into like it's almost like a dreamscape and of course i mean i actually haven't seen any other satoshi Kon films which is very I need to do something about that because this movie is great and I've heard so many good things about his other films. So for number eight, we're going to move out of Japan, but we're going to stay within the medium of animation. And instead we're going to move to Chile and Germany. It is a joint production uh, for 2018's The Wolf House, directed by Cristobal Leon and Joaquin Consigna. Consigna, I think. I think I pronounced it right. This film is a claymation. It is very much, it's kind of a folk horror kind of thing. It's very much kind of a, a fairy tale-esque plot line, but it is all told in claymation and very visceral images. It's very metaphorical, but also very kind of disturbing images. There's just a lot there. There's a lot to take in. I think it's one of those films, I've only seen it a couple times, but it is one of those films you could watch it a hundred times and pick up something new every time. There's there's just that amount of visual detail and a lot of just like interrelation and metaphor and things like that. I, I, I can't recommend it enough. For number nine, we're going to be staying in Latin America, but moving up north to Guatemala 
to discuss 2019's La Llorona, directed by Yero, ooh, I can't read my handwriting, Bustamante. This movie is very good at building up a slow, creepy atmosphere. The visuals are just very, they, they're very, like, gray. Like, it's, 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 the film is in color, but it, it just seems like everything's, like, a bit darker. Like, very, very kind of, kind of, like, a veil of depression, a veil of sadness over it, which really helps the message come across, which is, well, this film deals with some real-world horror. The Mayan Genocide. Uh, so, yeah, and it, it does a very good job of taking this legend, which is, seems to be, there seem to be versions of it, from my understanding, throughout at least northern Latin America, so like Mexico, the southwestern United States, and uh, obviously Guatemala and Central America and other places, seem to be versions of it throughout. And it does a very good take of modernizing this classic uh, legend and bringing it into more modern day and having it say a message about something very pressing and very real. Yeah, it's, it's a very good film, it's very moving, and it's very... more importantly for this, uh, it's very creepy <laughs> and very effective. So number 10 on this list is a movie I saw for the first time over the weekend. <laughs> 2021's Titan, directed by Julia Ducournau. This film is... oh, it's... It's an experience. It's like a B-movie plot, but executed by someone with actual, like, artistry and artistic vision and artistic competence. Like, it's... it's wild. Um, I don't want to give too much away, because it did just... it is still in theaters right now, but there are a lot of very interesting themes that are explored throughout the film, like pregnancy, gender dysphoria, uh, and also things about family trauma, familial trauma, things like that. And, you know, I, I think one thing that really struck me about the film is that its pacing is basically the opposite of what a horror film typically is. Like, the first half of the film is just hyper-violent. Like, really violent. <laughs> lots, lots of deaths. <laughs> and then the second half, it just tones down to be more of like a family drama. And it's, it's interesting. It's definitely a film I want to go back and see <laughs> in theaters. Um, I was really struggling whether or not to put in Ducournau's other film, Raw, from 2016, which is really good as well. But um, I haven't seen it in a few years, so and I felt so I felt a bit more comfortable recommending Teton. Although uh, I will also take the moment here to say watch Raw as well. It's really good. <laughs> And that's my top 10 horror film list. Have you seen any of these films? What did you think of them? Have I made you want to check out any of the ones that I mentioned? What are, what are your top movies? Tell me your top movies in the comments. Or you can just give me a like and subscribe. Uh, or any of those other fun things. My name's Will. This has been Will to Read. And I'll probably actually be talking about books next time.